Maine's labor crisis. A CBS 13 Your Voice, Your Future town hall. Presented in partnership with the Maine Department of Labor. Or I can give you four gummy bears. I definitely need more people. I just can't find anyone to work with me now. I think we've never seen turnover like this. You can tell that they're turning away people. The signs are everywhere, mostly help wanted signs. From the mountains to the sea, companies with jobs to fill scrambling to find employees. There is no industry that doesn't have shortages in their workforce. With the workforce and economy disrupted, what's the solution to get and keep employees to help our communities, our companies, and our economy? You know, valuable employees are one of those things that once you get them, you want to keep them. For answers, we've gathered some of the leaders in Maine industry from Hannaford, Hospitality Maine, and BIW, plus the Department of Labor. It's a Your Voice, Your Future Town Hall, Maine's labor crisis, and it starts right now. And a very special hello and welcome to our special town hall discussion. We have a connected and diverse group of leaders and experts ready to talk about this incredibly important issue for the state of Maine. In fact, when it comes to issues like the economy, jobs, Maine's labor force, I think we'd be hard pressed to find a better four person panel to dive into this issue than what we've assembled right now. So let's introduce them to you right now. I'm joined by Ashley Sweat. She is a talent acquisition manager at BIW. We also have Tony Giampetruzzi. He is the head of internal communications, engagement, and diversity for Hannaford. And right there, you have two of the better known companies in all of Maine. So welcome to both of you. Thanks. We also have the commissioner of the Department of Labor, Laura Fortman, of bringing a statewide policy perspective as well. And last but certainly not least, we have Derek Fassett. He is the head of Education and Workforce Development for Hospitality Maine. That's a trade group that represents one of Maine's best known and most diverse industries in the entire state. So again, as we mentioned, a pretty great panel, and we're glad to have all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And let's go ahead and jump into it. First, I want to mention our point here today, our focus, isn't really to rehash this problem. Certainly, we'll <coughs> touch on it. That's the part of the goal here today. Our focus, though, is to really focus on solutions. Talk about things that will move us forward. And with that thought, let's go ahead and start with Ashley again. BIW, great known company, thousands of jobs. Important for people to realize, though, a big diversity of jobs there, too. And you don't necessarily have to have you know, a very specific talent. You certainly need specific trade skills, et cetera. But you're ready to work with people and train them up and, and meet them where they are. Absolutely. So a lot of us, a lot of people consider us a very much a trade-based company. But that's not, although that is true, it's not all about BIW. So, you know, when we think of BIW, it's our own little town. You know, we have seven, almost 7,000 people that work there, over 200 different type of job opportunities. So when you think of all the things that, you know, run a town, it's the same thing at BIW. So very trades focused, of course, we need people to physically build our ships, but we have finance and we have supply chain and maintenance, our own security, medical and firefighting teams, um, engineers, designers. So what we're really trying to push is that we have such a broad, we have a lot of different opportunities. And like you said, we don't need those specific skill sets. We're gonna train a lot of that, but you know, just see what all the different options are and whether you feel that you have that background or you don't, there's an opportunity for you at BIW. Yeah, there's a lot, um, and a a lot, lot of different things. Yeah, as you and a lot of people don't don't realize that. I don't know how many times I've gone to a career fair and somebody has said, "Well, I'm not a welder. I, I can't work at BIW." Well, I'm not a welder either, but I work at BIW, and we have a lot, a lot of people that you know rely on BIW to be able to flourish in their career that doesn't involve building, physically building a ship. We and, need those support. And, and Tony, support. I know a lot of that has to resonate with you as well. Hannaford, obviously you're immersed in a lot of communities all across the state of Maine, headquartered right there in Scarborough. But you too have a huge diversity of jobs. And in fact, you, there's a huge range of development that can happen too. I know some of the executives, I, I, I think, started as part-time workers there. Mike Vale, our president, he actually, I believe he started as a bagger, uh, went to college at Colby, and um, out of college became one of our retail management trainees, uh, which is a program that we have uh, where we actually recruit uh, people within colleges to come in and, and sort of begin that leadership um, process. Of course, he's the president now. Um, so, and there are many other leaders in the organization who began in that program. Um, and there are other programs too, uh, but I do wanna, you know, I want to uh, certainly acknowledge that um, yes, there, there is the misconception that it is only a retail organization. 
it's not really a misconception. It is a retail organization. And um, some of the, you know, people think of it as, uh, as baggers and, and cashiers. And by the way, those are some of the most important jobs in the entire company because they are driving the customer experience and, um, and you know, listening and, and, and talking every single day. And prove their value in the pandemic, certainly. Yeah. Without a doubt. For all of us. Absolutely. Um, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, but in those stores, um, there are many, many leaders. And as you mentioned, our corporate headquarters are, are right at, uh, right at our, our large building that's being remodeled down in uh, Scarborough. And something that I think is, is really important to remember is that we have all these great programs like My Hannaford Rewards and Hannaford To Go and you know, DEI efforts and all of these things that require um, lots of different skills. So finance, HR, marketing, designers, you name it. Like a village, uh, like Ashley was saying. That's exactly idea. right. That's exactly right. And uh, so there's lots of opportunities and people come into the company um, organically um, up through the stores into that home office. And uh, we do a lot of outreach, like the retail management uh, trainee program. We have a very robust internship program. And as well, we just started a, um, a uh, the groceries to grads. Uh, which is a tuition reimbursement program, which uh, is a very generous program for all associates, regardless of, of, of your uh, rank within the company. And let's bring Laura Fortman into the conversation, bringing sort of a statewide leader perspective here too. We, we recently got numbers from your department saying the unemployment rate in Maine has ticked down once again to 2.9%. That sounds great, except when it comes to what we're talking about here today, trying to recruit people from a shrinking applicant pool. How is the state sort of working with a BIW and a Hannaford and a Hospitality Maine and all these companies all across the state to sort of help to get positions, get people the skills to jobs? Great question, Greg. And I'd like to say that that 2.9%, I look at it as good news um, because it's also coupled with the fact that we also have more filled jobs than we have ever had before. We hit that number in January as well. So even though we're seeing lots of help wanted signs, companies have been able to fill positions and the economy is growing. And the way that it's able to grow is not only from some programs like some of the employers who've already spoken have mentioned, employers are investing more in um, recruiting and retention and creative programs, but also looking at folks who in the past, when unemployment was a little bit higher, were left on the sidelines. So we're looking um, at people with disabilities who are now coming into the workforce. They are skilled, talented folks who have wanted to work in the past. And frequently, there were barriers in place to keep them from engaging. So we're seeing folks like that coming in. We're seeing folks who are in recovery um, who are also being welcomed in and supported by employers. And we're seeing state investments being made in things like apprenticeship programs, uh, progressive employment programs, and in helping um, employers tweak their recruitment uh, strategies, how they're um, advertising for jobs. Uh, and I'll just talk as like a, as a, a state employer right now. Um, I think that when our original applications were um, set up, one of the goals, because it was during high unemployment, was to find the most talented um, uh, applicants as possible. And you might have hundreds of people applying for the job. So you designed your application to kind of screen people out. Mm -hmm. Now we're saying, okay, how do we bring people in? Let's look at how we're doing broaden our recruiting. Your, your yes, focus. broaden that pool. Um, and let's make sure we get people who may um, have something that's not exactly a perfect fit, but with programs like Tony talked about, could be wonderful additions uh, for the employer. How about you, Derek? Again, hospitality man, as we mentioned, from restaurants to lodging, everything in between. I mean, we're talking about thousands of employers and thousands, tens of thousands of jobs across the state of Maine. And in fact, you guys have launched this sort of these these pathways, I think, is one way to look at it, of getting people into jobs and into these positions around the state. You recently launched this Dirigo Hospitality 2025 initiative. Maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So we represent what most people would expect us to represent, lodging and restaurants across the state. But we also have a huge chunk of our membership that are what we call allied members that are other industries that want to support hospitality because of its importance to the state. And across the board, we have the huge gamut from mom and pop shops all the way up to the, some of the larger chains that come into the state 
and support that hospitality industry and come with a variety of jobs, everything from what people think of immediately, which is your front desk clerks and your servers, all the way up to top end management and leadership. But what we're finding is that because of some of the reduction in staff numbers, they're having to do more with less. And so two years ago, our Ed Foundation board established a strategic plan which is heavily steeped in workforce called Dirigo Hospitality 2025, and it includes everything that you would expect to see in a comprehensive workforce development strategy. And my goal has been to try to execute that plan. So for the last year and a half, I've been developing frameworks, working closely with the Department of Labor to establish some programming. Uh, they were gracious enough to give us a, a grant that is supporting a major initiative in the registered apprenticeship realm because programs like that that can arm people to do more with less usually boils down to some sort of training and how can you empower that employee to come in and be expected to have more responsibility, be expected to do more, you have to support them. And so all of us here at the table today have some ways that our organizations are working to empower those frontline workers. And, and as we broaden the conversation, go back to everybody here too, it sounds like, again, clearly, depending on the job and the people, you guys are in competition with each other a little bit, but there sounds like there's a lot of collaboration as well that happens when it comes to the sort of the goals, the overarching goals of making sure that we are getting main people the opportunities that they deserve to sort of fill these jobs. I actually, maybe I'll send it back to you. I mean, again, you clearly recruit nationwide if you need to, but you really have a lot of focus right here in Maine as well. Absolutely. So we've really concentrated our efforts over the past couple of years. We've really gone out of state, um, but of course of the housing and the issues that are surrounding what we have within the state, we've really tried to focus um, what can we do with the people we already have um, or the people that are getting ready to enter the workforce or the people that are looking to change their career path because we get that a lot. Um, we have a lot of different opportunities as far as training um, and when we're out on the road and we're recruiting, we're really trying to make sure that we're pushing those training events and where we also, our main focus this year is to really focus on our high school and middle school pipeline recruiting. Even down to middle school. Absolutely. Making sure they're getting the right skills in the education. Yeah, system. absolutely. So I know a lot of some of the CT schools around the state are holding these summer camps that will teach kids how to do a little bit of welding and a little bit of other things. And you could probably speak more to that. But <laughs> I it's saw a Laura really, nodding as you yeah, were talking. It's a really <laughs> exciting opportunity <laughs> for us to, for everybody and for the children involved, to really get excited about, you know, working with their hands or, you know, learning other skills that they may not have known that they even liked. Yeah. Um, you know, so that that's one of our big fo focuses. We have a lot that's going on internally um, and externally. So we have partnerships because we can't do it alone. The more people... Oops, no, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, Laura, it, it's, you can't do it alone. I think it's yeah, a great segue yeah. to what Laura would like yeah. to talk about. The more people that you have on your side, you need that pipeline, mm -hmm. and you need those people there supporting you as a business to say, hey, BIW is hiring, Hannaford is hiring, you know, all these different opportunities because, like I said, we can't do it alone. We need those people that are pushing the candidates to us from those type of avenues, and word of mouth goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of our biggest recruiting mm -hmm. efforts is how do we get our name out there? How can we change things internally, which I know we'll get to down the road, but how can we satisfy our employees that we have right now to right. be able to go out and promote BIW and say, come, for, yeah, for come work at BIW. It's a great place to work. I think you touched yeah, on Laura, it. Yeah, Laura, you want to take I mean, it from there? I think there are two things that Ashley said that I want to just follow up on a little bit. One is around the CTEs. So those are the career technical centers across the state. There are 27 of them. Um, and we have um, worked closely with our colleagues over at the Department of Education, um, as well as the community college, so the education side of the house, as well as industry and unions to create pre-apprenticeship programs so these young people can try things out. I mean, Derek talked a little bit about apprenticeship, and it's like give people a taste, especially at a young age, to see what might work for them and then what would a career path look like. 
And then I do want to just say one more thing, and that's when Ashley was talking about making those connections. I mean, we see all kinds of people all over the state. And when we work in partnership with companies, we know what jobs are available. And so we can help somebody when they're coming in to say, oh, here are some transferable skills that you can use. We can also have um, specific job fairs for companies like BIW, or we partner with Hospitality Maine to really promote what's available there. And then again, how do we all collaborate and work together? Yeah, Derek, want to pick up from there? Those partnerships are absolutely key. So one of the things that we're trying to do for our membership is to create a giant funnel by connecting with as many partners around the state as we can, whether that's somebody like the Department of Corrections, with they've got five facilities around the state that have culinary training. Working with the CTE schools that often have culinary or hospitality training right there for the high school kids that can become a pre-apprenticeship program with the new regulations that are in place to create a quality pathway straight into the industry, or whether it's with other agencies that might fall under a DEIA umbrella, such as the Bureau of Rehab Services or Maine Immigration and Refugee Services, or really any of them. And I wanna to bring Tony back into the conversation, but let's maybe bring another element in here first. Uh, the building trades, of course, have been huge right now. We have, we've been talking ad nauseum, frankly, about the housing shortage in Maine. Construction jobs are as hot as ever right now. Associated General Contractors, or AGC, is a group that's really working on the front lines of this issue. Our Dan Lamparello recently had a chance to have a conversation with Kelly Flagg from AGC about the construction immersion program they have that we've been talking a little bit about, uh, sort of the apprenticeship idea. Let's go ahead and listen to what they had to say about that. You're offering incentives to get them in there, get their foot in the door uh, early on and learn as they go, that hands-on training. But students who are graduating or who have recently graduated and not moved on to a solid career pathway can participate in our, our six-week construction immersion program. They're going to leave that program with everything they need to go on to a job site. And what I mean by that is they're going to get their OSHA training. They're going to get first aid CPR. They're going to learn basic hand tools, basic power tools. They're going to have a couple of, you know, the base certifications they need to go to work. The students get exposed to who are the people I might work for? What does their work look like? And then they get a hands-on opportunity to try something that's representative of what that work in the field would, would be. By the end of that six weeks, those students are going to be exposed to anywhere from 10 to 13 different employers. They're going to have a hiring event. And the goal is for those students to go immediately into an apprenticeship program. Well, there you go. Talking about apprenticeship, I, I know BIW's talked a little bit about that. Laura Fortman has talked about that. We're going to get to both of them. But first, I promised to Tony from Hannaford I'd get to him as well. This is the trade skills we're talking about, but some of these ideas I think are transferable. What you're trying to do as well when it comes to finding people where they are, reaching into communities, making sure you have, a, you have a, you know, conversations and connections with uh, high schools, with different communities. Tell us how that works for Hannaford when it comes to having these sort of pathways. Um, there's so many ways, and I think that you know it's been it's been touched upon by uh, a number of the panelists here. Those partnerships are are so key, and you know when I think about the partnerships that we have, but also um, what Laura brought up around diversity and creating access for people. That's so important. Um, a lot of our efforts right now are focused on new Mainers um, and programs uh, where with uh, uh, Portland Adult Ed, uh, working with organizations such as In Her Presence, um, which create those access points to bring uh, people into the company and teach them skills and help them um, get the get the, the various uh, different um, skills and, and opportunity that they need to actually thrive in the workplace. So that's happening as well, and, and, and it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I know, Tony, you've worked with these issues for, for, for decades here in Maine, and I know that uh, we've talked for years about brain drain. That was certainly an issue we were talking 20 years about for Maine. It sounds like we're really sort of, as we talk about broadening this scope, uh, there's a real big focus on making sure we, we've already talked about it here on the panel, that we're really recruiting outside of the box. We're thinking of everybody, what could they bring to the table, whether it's new Mainers, people transitioning from one job to another because, for example, a mill is closing down. You know, obviously the Department of Labor law is working very closely with companies and these individuals. Yeah, it, those are things that and we do. And the apprenticeship program. And the apprenticeship that we program, on yeah. And um, one thing about apprenticeship that we didn't talk about is that it's also a mechanism for retention. That we see when someone goes through an apprenticeship program, there's a, at least um, 
over 80% stay with that employer. And right now, when we're seeing, sometimes people cycle in and out of jobs. Apprenticeship is a proven mechanism um, to help people learn the skills that they need, get paid while they're learning those skills, and stay loyal to that particular company. So I, I think ask, that's what, exciting. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that apprenticeship is such a powerful means for creating loyalty, both from the company to the employee and the employee to the company? Because there's an agreement between them. It's a very clear, you know what you're getting into. As an employee, I know what skills I'm going to learn. I know what the benchmarks are. I know that the company is investing in me. And so that creates that loyalty. And for the employer, I mean, I can let any of the employers talk, but from what I've heard, it's that they know that they're getting folks who have the specific skills that are required to be successful in those jobs. So I think it's, a, it's definitely a win-win. It also opens opportunities to people um, who sometimes have been left out. We're seeing, because of the, the DEIA um, emphasis, that more women and people of color are being recruited into these occupations, and we definitely need to, um, to make sure that everyone is welcome. And the other thing that we're also doing, and I keep looking at Derek because he's, he's part of this team that's, that's working on the apprenticeship with us, is to provide um, supports for employers because Tony talked about how to help new Mainers feel comfortable as they're coming in a job. What we hear from employers, too, is that they don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. or So there, there's discomfort on the employer side. So we're also working with our Department of Economic and Community Development to do a toolkit for employers as well. So again, we're all learning. We're all collaborating and growing. Go ahead, Derek. One of the beautiful things about apprenticeship particularly the Department of Labor version registered apprenticeship, is that it plays really well with all the other programs that are out there. So government programs can layer, and you can create entire packages that support almost anything that you're trying to target, whether that be the diversified workforce, whether that be home growing your own talent because you can't find the people who are already steeped in experience and, and training. Um, and it lets that employer immediately broaden their labor pool by searching outside of those that are coming to them pre-trained and providing an opportunity for somebody who doesn't know everything, who can come in and step in and be trained. So long as they come to the employer with those soft skills, and even if they don't, there's opportunities throughout things like adult ed through their work ready programs to earn those soft skills and move right into one of these programs. Yeah, we've already sort of, we've been talking about recruitment, training, education, those are huge parts of what we're talking about today. We've already sort of transitioning into the other broad topic, which is retention. Once you get a qualified person, you know, uh, frankly, one of the better ways to, to build your company is not lose the good people you already have. And I know you, you Ashley, were just talking about a little bit about that just a moment ago. Absolutely. So. Over the last six months, we've seen a huge decrease in our turnover. Um, we've been really focusing a lot on what can we do for the, the employees that we have now. Um, you know, our new president that we have has brought a clear direction of what he envisions the shipyard to be. And the communication that comes along with that is huge. The shipyard is all on the same page and it's exciting. You know, you can, you can see the shift in the workforce and, you know, you can see the excitement that is of BIW. What we do is important and, we're, and we can say it as much as we want, but we need our employees to feel that. Um, it, we need, we want them to have that same mission that we do. Um, we have started to work on employee engagement or employee events. We've really focused on just within the last couple of months, we've done a stay interview. Um, we've taken about 200 different people and had sit down meetings with them because we are at the point where we weren't talking to people until they've already given their notice. So we were doing exit interviews. Well, we need to figure out what's not working with the employees that we have before they're out the door so we can make those changes. So we've had some positive changes since then. By getting that feedback? And Absolutely. One, it was a big policy change as well that related to time off. So it was, it was definitely something that was heard and we took action and that's what we're going to continue to do. Um, and the reach back training for all of our employees, that's important. They need to feel that they're trained so that they can be successful in their job. People want to work. They want to be successful. They want to have meaningful work and they want to do a good job. So when we, when we arm them with all those tools and resources, 
I think we even mentioned it a little bit with the apprenticeship. You have that um, they want to stay with you. Yeah, that, that loyalty yeah, sort of built exactly. up as well. And, I, yeah. and Tony, I know Hannaford, again, obviously it can be a stepping stone. Uh, there's a lot of people maybe trans they're, you're young and they're going to go off to college or something like that. But there are a lot of people who, like you've already given those examples, and this is true in the hospitality industry too. Yeah, but you want it to be transitional, fine, it can be that. But it can also grow into something. Absolutely, and I think that um, a lot of people do start with Hannaford and grow with Hannaford. We have, we are routinely celebrating 30, 40, 50 year anniversaries with the company, and that's something to really be proud of. And I think that that's because, you know, not only do we have a really strong, enduring culture, but we have a culture that's really kept pace with what people are looking for um, in a work environment. And that is a sense of belonging, that is a sense of purpose, and that is a sense of, of, of having a say in, in your environment. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it is about what you do and it's also about what you believe in. And I think that, you know, a couple great examples um, at Hannaford, you know, sustainability. Sustainability is very important to Mainers and it's very important to Hannaford, whether it's uh, waste generally or, um, you know, zero food waste, which we've recently achieved in every single one of our stores. I talk a lot about DEI. I think that's something that's very important to Mainers and it's very important um, to Hannaford. A great example is, uh, Hannaford has, for the 12th year in a row, achieved um, a 100% score on the Human Rights Campaign Corporate Equality Index, which designates it as a best place to work for LGBTQ people. That's really important for our company, and it's unique to Maine, and I think it's unique to the industry. So those things are really important to people, to, to be able to feel like they truly belong in an environment, that they're going to be supported, that the environment is safe, and I think that that really drives, um, that drives the culture. And let's jump over to Derek, too. Looks like he wanted to jump in at that point. I, I totally agree that finding a place that is important to the employee as much as it is to the employer about what they're getting out of that employee is, is crucial. And recognizing the fact that most of our industries here represented at this table provide career opportunities and aren't necessarily sometimes associated with the stigmas that you might hear of, oh, it's just a summer job or, oh, it's what I'm going to do when I'm when I'm young, and then I'll get a real job. No, you talk to a lot of the people throughout the state, and you'll find that they may have started out and then grown throughout the company, and they made their, whatever field we're talking about, their entire career. Most of the people at the top had to start somewhere, just like everybody. And uh, we're sort of running out of time, but again, companies here, we, Laura, maybe give you the last word when it comes to this conversation. Yeah, a lot of pressure on you when it comes to that. <laughs> uh, we've heard with the last minute we have here, a lot of these ideas from these companies. And again, the state really from the big statewide umbrella view, this is what it means to bring Maine forward, is to help these companies, these industries, and our people connect to these jobs. I, I think you said it much better than I could, Greg. That, that is our goal. And, uh, you know, there was the 10-year economic development plan. That is crafted in order to bring all of the different industries together, to bring our university and our community college education systems together and be driven by um, achieving success for both, you know, main people and businesses. We all have to work together in order to thrive. And I feel like we've just sort of scratched the surface on this topic and we're already out of time here. But a huge thank you to our panelists here today. And of course, you can uh, go to our website as well. You can go to their websites as well to get more information on the things we've talked about today, to learn more about how our communities are being connected to businesses, to skills, and to jobs, because that's what drives our entire economy forward. And again, as I mentioned, go to WGME.com to learn more about this initiative. Have a great night. Thank you for watching this interactive broadcast, Maine's Labor Crisis, presented in partnership with the Maine Department of Labor, sponsored by Bath Ironworks, Hospitality Maine, AGC Maine, Maine Construction Academy, and Hannaford. Make sure to stay connected with CBS 13 and Fox 23 on air, online, and through these social channels.